It was the 17th of May, 1938, and as the world's eyes were fixated on the American war that now involved Canada, Middle Africa had collapsed. Disturbing reports emerged out of various parts of Africa that were under German rule. It seemed that the Middle African administration had disintegrated completely. It was unclear why or how, but the administration, usually regarded as efficient abroad and known for its lavish expending, was no more. As the central government no longer could act, conflict sparked across the continent as the various kingdoms, tribes and protectorates that comprised it now fought amongst themselves over new claims and ancient grudges, and cliques of Ascadi and German colonial officers attempted to keep a semblance of normality. Whether this state of affairs was passing or a dark age of violence was truly the beginning of Africa was uncertain. The colonial mission of the German Empire had failed. Within this chaos, the spearhead of it all, South Africa, had struck a dominionist victory. After a contentious election, which had divided the Union of South Africa in two, the Dominion Party, led by General Jan Christian Smuts, had declared victory, though with the slimmest of majorities in the country's parliament. Voting in South Africa was restricted mainly to whites, split between the Afrikaners in the north and the British in the south. And with the British supporting Smuts, they were able to achieve victory. Unrest in the Afrikaner areas was on the rise, particularly among those who feared Dominion plans for a reapproachment with the Entente, and many were predicting the country would fall to violence. Though all the pieces were moving within Africa, the United States did not have any ear for that whatsoever. Their capital city, Washington DC, had fallen in the past days dealing a devastating blow to morale. Though they had lost this territory, over the past couple of months they were able to take back a lot more ground, meaning that they were still standing even without this iconic city in their hands. The battle fought by the Canadians along the western front line had now turned into a slugfest where under-equipped soldiers from Canada and Britain were dealing with low-morale syndicalist troops tired and exhausted from the weeks of traveling through the American countryside to reach the invaders. As Canada was being halted at several locations on the field, multiple military staff had their own suggestions to bring to the Prime Minister. One of these was Wilfred Curtis, who proposed a new plan to further the expansion of the Air Force. It was even more ambitious than the plans of Bishop and would call for great reform. The problem with the proposal was that it recommended that this be a Canada first endeavor and called for the removal of older RAF advisors from the program to get a fresh perspective. This would lead to most of the older British advisors from the pre-revolution days being removed from offices of influence. The proposal was out of the question. The manpower needed to get this moving wasn't even possible and thus it was shut down hard. Though in the west, the Canadians had trouble pushing through and on some areas were even forced to retreat up north, in the east, a connection between the Americans and Canadians had almost been made. A large group of two to three thousand syndicalist troops divided the two factions, though a small workaround connection was established earlier. Along the shore, French ships waved the flags of victory in support of the war and to signal that help was on its way. The countryside was divided by big lakes and rivers, making the crossing and mobility of the infantry very poor. Though the held territory by the 3,000 syndicalist troops decreased each day, they were still not able to break through. And so, some of the Americans just went around them to link up with the Canadian forces. The spirits of the US troops were not as high as they were before the fall of Washington, but they would still not give up without a fight. The Canadians had lost 4,000 men during the one and a half months that the war was now going on for them. As was feared, the entire front to the Midwest was too wide to handle by the few troops that Canada could spare. In June, some were pushed back to the point of the enemy standing on the brink of invading Canada. In Europe, Bulgaria, that had settled in its new governments in the Balkan states, had declared war on the Ottoman Empire that was still interwoven in battles all throughout. 
And soon thereafter, the war between the Pacific States and Mexico came to a close with Mexico now having full control and standing on the doorstep of Canada. And then the syndicalists indeed invaded Canada as multiple areas along the front were wiped out or forced to retreat. But from the east, through the connection established between the Canadians and the US, American soldiers headed in to help their northern brothers. The expansion of the Canadian invasion was quickly halted as the Americans had the enemy surrounded. The link-up had done wonders as Americans poured into the Canadian lands and were resupplied and fed. In the east of Canada, the first of the Portuguese had arrived ashore and were on their way to the battlefield to stand side by side with their allies. Though the initial help of the Americans kept the syndicalists from heading deeper into Canadian territory, it did not avert the CSA to head into the country from a different angle. Currently, the Americans did not have enough troops stationed there to keep border watch everywhere. But luckily, and just as planned, the Australasian troops had arrived in the west and were on their way to help defend the border. Though the incoming allies were a reason to be overjoyed, for about 15,000 troops stationed around Detroit, it fell on deaf ears as they had been cut off completely and were surrounded. More and more Americans familiarized themselves with the Canadian countryside as they were preparing for an attack from the north as well to divide the CSA main armies along the Midwest and East Coast. In Europe, news came out that the Austrian Empire had signed a white peace with the Ottomans, something that happened a lot recently as the Ottomans had their hands full with so many enemies surrounding them. Two months now that the war had been including the Entente, mixtures of Australasian, Canadian, British and American infantry combined their forces to withhold the invading syndicalists. But the CSA received help from allies as well, as Russia had sent in some of their best men, a few who were involved in the surrounding of the cut-off Detroit troops. To make things worse, the connection between the Americans and Canadians had been split as well. The split was not large, and higher-ups believed they would able to link up again within the next two weeks. With so many troops and supplies needed to traverse through Canada, King Edward believed it of the utmost importance to improve infrastructure to allow quick passage for each and every one and everything. The Americans and Canadians could really use some positive news, and this arrived in the form of acknowledgement that the Portuguese and West Indies faction had successfully pulled off a naval invasion to the south of the US forces. The Civil War had transformed into an utterly bloody mess of a conflict concerning many different countries and their soldiers. Sardinia, small but noble, also had set foot on American soil to help protect it from being further diminished by the syndicalists. The US Navy had attempted an invasion around Houston, but though being able to capture the city, they were soon out of supplies and bound to lose the area once more. On the 1st of July, word got out that Washington had once again been captured by the US troops. Battles above the city still raged on with planes looming at one another. It was at the Second Battle of Washington where ace pilot Francis Hastings, known under the call sign Moose, had distinguished himself in not only returning alive from the recent mission over the Northeast, but living through significant victories in many critical encounters. Held up as a shining example of Canadian courage, Francis's recent promotion had been highly publicized. Although the people may view war as more hell than glory, many were glad to see that there were still heroes to rally behind. Ten days later, the feared escalation in South Africa occurred. With their recent victory in the South African 1936 elections, the Dominion Party under President Jan Smuts was confident it could implement its sweeping changes to the country's governmental system in a planned federation, regardless of protests from the Afrikaner provinces of Transvaal and the Oranje Free State. Today, that confidence was proven ill-founded as leaders in Pretoria and Bloemfontein declared their secession from the Union and the creation of the South Afrikaanse Republiek. Battle lines had already been drawn, spitting the country in two, as a new Boer War was broken out to determine South Africa's path once more. That same day, Russia roared as well, as it was war-hungry for more territory it claimed was theirs by right. The world was bleeding all over, and this was not even the worst of it all. The worst 
had yet to come.